there folks and welcome or welcome back to Nippon Trading International's Japan Real Estate Podcast. I'm your host Ziv Nakajima again and this podcast is brought to you among others by Emil Gorgis of realestate.jp. He's a Tokyo real estate agent who specializes in serving international or mixed nationality families who are looking for the perfect family home. So Emil's an Australian, he's been living here in Japan for over two decades now, and for about half of that time he's been buying, selling, and managing real estate properties in Tokyo on behalf of his own family and a great many happy clients. And he also acts as a mortgage broker on behalf of his clients. So he's got dedicated loan officers in many of the Japanese mega banks. And if you're a regular listener of the podcast, you probably already know him from our JREP, the Japan Real Estate Experts Panel Sessions which means that you're already aware of the fact that the man is an absolute fountain of wisdom on all things related to real estate in Japan, and in particular to family homes, the greater Tokyo metropolitan area, and mortgages. And most importantly, he's incredibly generous with his time and advice, which he's more than happy to provide at no cost or commitment to anyone asking. So if you've been thinking about buying your home in Tokyo, but you've been sitting on the fence for a while, or you just want to have a chat in English with a real expert, Drop him a line on sales at realestate.jp. Hit him up today and start exploring your options. All right, so for today's episode, this is a conversation I had uh, a long while ago. I found it in um, some uh, long lost file (laughs) in the Zoom folder with a potential client who by now is already an existing client. He's originally from Brazil, married to a Japanese spouse and now based in Qatar. And his inquiries were all related to investment properties in Japan. So what are investment loan requirements, what are current prices and yield trends, how taxes work, and then a bit more of an interesting conversation regarding the way we analyze investment deals. So how do we arrive at the numbers that we put on our spreadsheets? And if you've got the option to watch the video on this one, not just listen to the audio, you'll also be able to see some of those sheets and what's in them. So worth hopping over to our YouTube channel if you can. We'll link to the video in this episode's podcast show notes if that's where you're tuning in from. We then discuss how to search for potential investment properties on the typical Japanese websites, what purchase and sale costs are involved, how realtor commissions work in Japan, and also we talk a bit about the pros and cons of purchasing individual units as opposed to entire buildings, how can we be engaged to represent buyers, what can be done via proxy like ourselves, and what, if anything, still needs to be done in person. Um, how our fees work, what our credentials are, um, what are Japanese tenants and professional services companies like uh, compared with other countries. And finally, another short and amusing little conversation on the topic of Japanese spouses and how they sometimes respond to their foreigner husbands when they wish to invest in Japan or anywhere else for that matter. So fun little conversation, which I think you'll enjoy. Lean back, listen in, and I'll see you again on the other side. No problem. Okay, so I've just browsed through your email. Let me bring that up again. Okay. You were talking about investment properties, right? Yeah, yeah, investment properties. And you're based Be- <clears throat> in Japan, in Kobe, I think? Uh, no, no, actually, I live in the Middle East. I live in Qatar. However, okay. uh, my wife is Japanese. So basically we have, uh, I have the residency and we keep going back and forth between Qatar and Japan. But in theory, I also live in Japan. But actually, let's say 30 days a year, I go to Japan, but I do have the residency and everything. But my income is from Qatar. But I'm I'm from Brazil originally. I'm just, we are just in Qatar for work. Okay. That's how, yeah. So as uh, you wrote, you're probably not eligible for a loan, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, the first time I emailed you, actually, I was still reading your book. And after you, I read your one of your ebooks, I went through so many podcasts. And actually, I kind of answered most of the questions I had through your previous podcast. Yeah. Um, and I realized, yeah, I cannot get the, the loan because I don't have the income in Japan. Uh, but it, but it's okay because the loan I was thinking maybe for the future uh, the, as a first investment I would like to do in cash as well. I was just curious about the, how the loan works because I wanted to take a advantage of such a low interest rates in Japan, like free free money almost. 
Yeah, but, so that that yeah. becomes more of an option when you become a permanent resident, but also you need to have an income stream in Japan, which you don't have at the moment. So until yeah. you have a well-established portfolio or a company generating some kind of income, that's probably not going to be an option for the next few years. Yeah. And the other question I had, one in one of the emails, you mentioned the numbers have changed a little bit since uh, you wrote your ebook. Yep. And I was wondering, like, which, uh, are you talking about yields or exchange rate or everything? Yeah, so the exchange rates obviously fluctuate all the time. They yeah. go up and down. At the moment, it's a good time to buy yens, but, you know, previous years was different. So I'm, I'm not referring mm -hmm. to that, but the price of properties in most of the major cities has continued to grow mm -hmm. in some places more sharply than others, but rents haven't really gone up that much. So as that gap be okay. between the purchase price and the rental price gets bigger, the yields, of course, shrink as well, right? So okay. if in the books, I think in the books, we're talking about some properties that were 9, 10% net before tax. Yeah. That's not really not really something that we see anymore. If we get to seven these days, we're pretty happy. I see. Yeah, I see. Probably because of inflation, I guess. I don't know. Because um, Japan didn't see inflation for many well, years. Whatever. And now. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, it's a chicken and egg yeah. thing. But basically, whenever, whenever there's crisis in the world, Japan becomes attractive because it's nice and stable. Yeah, and then a lot of people were actually buying here all throughout COVID, and and started. I mean, prices in Tokyo, Osaka, Fukuoka started going up about ten years ago, and they haven't really stopped even throughout COVID. Mm -hmm. um, I see. Other cities too, <laughs> Nagoya, Kyoto, Sapporo have seen some price hikes. Um, the smaller, medium townships, not so much. So we can still get up to about seven percent in smaller satellite cities or prefectural capitals and in the big mm -hmm. cities um tokyo osaka maybe five percent if we're lucky usually more like four other cities mm -hmm. maybe up to, up to six percent net before tax okay okay yeah and the tax i was gonna ask you about tax but actually i i ended up understanding i read your book again and it's there the tax uh uh the information about tax so income tax rise like uh up to 350 380,000 yen right that's it's actually the threshold is easier now it starts at 480 i think so ah, okay up to yeah. about 4500 bucks a year in net pre-tax income is non-taxable mm -hmm. okay. um, and then beyond that it's the same similar percentages to what you see on our website or in the book so okay. it goes up to 5% after that, and then up to 2 million yen a year. It's um, Then it goes up to 10% after that, and pretty pretty mm -hmm. lenient on taxes okay. compared to other countries, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And okay, and uh, yeah, basically I had like a list of questions, but in the end I kind of saw all the answers through your previous podcast, so I'm just that like... Means that we do sure a good job. That's good to hear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> But I thought we have the scheduled meeting at least to make sure it's updated information. So I'm just, but actually I've seen most of the things I wanted to ask. I've seen already. Yeah. So I guess we and, can, uh, if you tell me a little bit uh, about your budget, then we can do some sample research and just um, show you what can be had at that budget. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. You had a question there? Yeah. Like I saw one, uh, how do you say, deal analysis. So I saw your spreadsheet and, um, I think I pretty much understood everything there, but I was wondering. So you have the purchase cost, which is good included in the uh, analysis. So is it is it correct to assume from because the purchase cost I will have only on the first year? So this means the yield would would increase a little bit from the second year onwards because I won't have any purchase cost or um no. So we factored those purchase costs into the total price of the property. And then oh, we factor okay. we factor the yield based on how much you get every year divided by the total purchase cost. So ah, that's included okay. in there from the start. The yield okay. will drop over time <laughs> due to other reasons, not go up usually. So the building, if you're buying um, individual units, the building fees will go up as the building gets older. Yeah. Um, 
or rent will go down as the building gets older. We haven't really been able to raise rents in Japan. So mm -hmm. the yield you see in the spreadsheet is the yield at the time of the purchase. And then it slowly mm -hmm. goes down from there. And when it becomes, okay. you know, less than ideal for you, then you can just resell the property. Okay. Okay. And something more. Okay. I have a bank account in Japan. Okay. Uh, in, in my name, does it change the procedure in any way? Make it easier or it doesn't make any difference? Like well, if it's I work easier, with you, if you still have access to it, it's easier because we can direct all of the rental income to go in there and all of uh -huh. your automatically deductible expenses like building fees or cleaning company contracts or anything like that can automatically hopefully be deducted from there as well. So you won't need mm -hmm. us to run your, um, balance and income and expense sheets for you you'll be able to see all of that yourself but otherwise the process is about the same yeah okay, okay. And, and some of some of the fees just can't be paid automatically so you'll still need someone like us here to go to a convenience store or a post office yeah. or a bank and just pay some bill yeah i lived in japan for a year and i i remember i couldn't believe that my wife she had to go to kombini to pay the bills <laughs> yeah still still the case but i guess yeah. if the account is so you've got internet banking access to that account yes i have okay and the system yeah. is simple enough for you to be able to send transfers to another account in japan you know how to do that yeah yeah i've done Many okay, times so I've, in that I've case, received, a lot of the payments, yeah. like renovation companies or one-off payments to property managers, that can all be done by you. So we really won't need to manage almost anything except mm -hmm. the few bills that might need physical access. Okay, it's a Shinsei Bank, probably. Probably you know this. Oh yeah, so that's a that's yeah, an English yeah. online banking system, then, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's great. Uh, what else? Yeah. So you asked me about my my how do you say budget? So yep. I mean my total budget would be up to but probably not for one property or not for a start, but would be like about 10, 10 million. Yeah. One hundred ten million is about uh eighty thousand dollars or something like that. Ten million yen. Okay, so that's not yeah. going to be a small building. Obviously, that's going to be an a single unit, a mansion room. Mm -hmm. um let me just maximize the screen uh, sorry share the screen <coughs> and then i can show you what that might get you so and in, initially i was wondering like because my wife she's from okayama yep. so i was thinking better to look for a property property in this area but after listening to your, your podcast and Q&A, I realized it doesn't really make a difference, right? Where there's no advantage to have no. to purchase a property near where you are, right? It, in no. case of investment. Not if you're going to keep it tenanted, which is what we're hoping yeah. for. So no. Yeah. Okay. So can you see my screen now? Yeah, I can see. Okay. So I'll go down here. <laughs> I'll select up to 10 million yen. And I'll ask for only investment condominiums. And uh, let me switch to English for a sec so you know what I'm doing too. I'll look for a relatively high interest. Um, build year, let's say up to 30 years, because beyond that, uh, mm -hmm. the monthly expenses will start to go up a bit too quickly. Um we want ownership, not leasehold. And within 10 minute walk to a station. So we got 92 properties. Mm -hmm. Including that, let me just see if I haven't forgotten anything. 8% or more condominium investments. 30 year old 10 minute station and land ownership. Okay. So if you see here now, um, there's going to be a bunch of them in Osaka, Kobe. Um, but that this return that you see over here, the 955, 14.4, that's kind of nonsense. So let me show you what it yeah. actually looks like in real format. Let me just open okay. it. 
We interrupt this broadcast to tell you about Tokyo Family Stays. They're a short-term rentals company in Tokyo, and they offer a home away from home experience, which is just perfect for remote working, quarantining, if that's still a thing, or if you just need somewhere quiet to get away from the world. They offer a variety of options for families, corporate relocations, or even if you're simply transitioning between homes in Tokyo. The properties are super comfortable, tastefully furnished, fully equipped with all amenities, and they accommodate up to 10 people. So really the only thing you'll need to bring with you is your toothbrush and maybe a change of clothes. They come with fast unlimited wireless internet, dedicated workspaces, and fully equipped kitchens, and they're just a delight to stay in. Fantastic alternative to Japanese business hotels, which if you've ever stayed in one, you probably know they're tiny, they're noisy, fine for a night or two if you're on your own, but longer term or with a family, you'll probably feel you're in a jail cell very quickly in a Japanese business hotel. So if you want to give yourself a sense of space and freedom by renting a real home, with comfortable Western beds, including all the necessities like baby bedding, children's toys, high chairs, etc. You definitely want to reach out to Tokyo Family Stays. They've been at it for over a decade. They're a fully licensed minpaku or short-term stay operator. And as a special bonus for our viewers and listeners, they're also throwing in a breakfast basket upon arrival for anyone who books and mentions the Japan Real Estate Podcast or NTI. And not only for guests, if you're a property owner, you've got an investment property that you want to tweak for higher profit, or a holiday home that you want to rent out when you're not using it via short-term stays, drop them a line today, see how they can help you maximize your property's income. And again, as a special bonus to our viewers and listeners, they're also offering a free audit of your existing short-term stay listings without any obligation whatsoever. So feel free to reach out to them at tokyofamilystays.com. Well worth a visit. And again, if you're in the market for a family home in or around the Tokyo metropolitan area, Emil's your man. Don't be shy to reach out to him as well at sales at realestate.jp. And now back to the podcast. Okay, so you're seeing this Excel now? Yes, I'm seeing it. All right, so I'll delete all of that from here for a moment. So if I go back... <laughs> grab the data from here. So this is 5 million yen and the rent mm -hmm. per month is 40,000 yen. So I'm putting 5 million here. Rent per month, 40,000. And then I'll grab the building fees, which are 8, 8, and 3, 7. Put that here. And we're assuming a purchase cost of, a, it's the same thing, but let's call it 20%, including our cost. So that'll mm -hmm. be 4.3% net before I tax, see. right? Mm -hmm. um, if we go for any of the other listings, let's take, for example, uh, this uh, Sakaishi. I don't know what's the population number in Sakaishi. Let's take a more attractive city. Let's take Yokohama, for example. So this one is 9.3 and it's generating 65,000, 9.3 million, rent to 65,000, and 7,750, 4550, 7,750, 4550. So this one is 4.8, getting closer to 5%, mm -hmm. and that's in Yokohama City. So okay. those are the types of properties that we'll normally be looking at if your budget is up to 10 million yen. I wouldn't lock us in into one or two assets before we look at the actual properties, because sometimes it's going to be a really attractive one that's closer to a single asset, and sometimes oh, there'll be two of those smaller ones. So, I mean, let's let's take it case by case to say, decide which property makes most sense. I see, I see. Okay. Yeah. Okay, makes sense. But that's that's what okay. you'll be able to normally get. So sometimes Osaka, if we're lucky, Yokohama, Kobe, Fukuoka, maybe uh, definitely Nagoya, Sapporo, and maybe Kyoto, Saitama, Chiba cities. So a lot, a lot of either larger or medium-sized cities that we probably would fit into that budget. Okay. And now I have a few questions, like uh, future future questions. It's not for now. Like, let's say if I, of course, if I want to invest, I want it for the long term. Uh, but let's say if I need to sell it or I want to sell it, what are the costs involved to selling? Like, 
Um, normally, it's going to be 5 or 10%, depending on if we have to use a realtor if, or if we happen to have a customer. If we happen to have a customer who wants to buy that property, then we can just facilitate the transaction between you using a property lawyer, and then there's no real estate uh -huh. agent commission. Important. So in that case, you'll only be paying our fee, which is going to be 4 to 5%, depending on the price okay. of the property. And if there is an agent involved, that's another four, four and a half percent for their fee. And then they'll just list it on the normal market channels. But all other purchase costs are borne by the buyer. That's why in your case, we were looking at about 20 percent or 18 okay. percent. So the agents in Japan, they get commission from the buyer and the seller. Yes, that's correct. Uh, OK, OK. Just, I was just curious about it. And another thing, not for now, like um, if we talk about building, let's say if I had a budget that I could buy a building, what would be the advantage in buying, let's say, a building, a small building of six units instead of spreading these six units throughout Japan? What's the so, advantage of doing that? First of all, budget-wise, we haven't seen anything really attractive below, say, 40 million yen. So I would aim for mm -hmm. that budget or higher. And mm -hmm. then the advantages are, first of all, you've got a large land plot which obviously okay. is the only thing that might gain in value in Japan because the structures them themselves don't gain in value. No, um, so you've got more capital growth potential there. You also are flexible and you can get creative with the properties. So depending on zoning regulations, you could turn them into short-term stays, commercial properties uh, if somebody wants to rent an office, for example. So it just gives you more ability to, to tweak your income stream and to potentially gain a little bit more money um, overall. I see. But it also comes with, um, I mean, it's less stable, the income, because the entire structural maintenance is on you. There's no owner union collecting fees and making sure that they've got enough for renovation. Mm -hmm. So you need to put aside, let's say, about, I don't know, 10, 12 percent of your revenue for potential future and or at least have that buffer available in cash for potential mm -hmm. future renovations. If there's weather damage, earthquake, ty um, typhoon and whatnot, you'll suddenly have to replace a part of the roof or what have you. Right. So you uh -huh. want to put aside some money for these unstable sort of occurrences that you'll have if you own the entire structure. OK, OK. And also, there they be oh, they be wooden buildings, not concrete like the mansion units. So we'd probably advise mm. to go for twenty years and younger, not thirty and younger. Ah, okay, twenty and younger for the wooden. Okay, yeah, yeah. And the uh, what is it? Uh, ah, okay. I was a little bit like confused about the like because. If we do, if we work, I work with you, you're going to send me via email two documents, which I have to sign and certify them in where, wherever the notary I am, public right? or something. Yep. Notary public. Yeah. And it, it, these documents, I think it, they are in English, uh, yes. as far as I understood. And they, they will accept this in Japan. Like I was a bit, uh, yeah. So we provide the, them, yeah. we provide them with a translation to Japanese, which ah, we've already got okay. ready. And then we show them I the see. original next to the translation. And that suffices for us to represent in almost everything uh, for the actual ownership transfer of the property. When you know which property it is, you'll have to give a separate document to the property lawyer. Okay. okay. And if there's a court case <clears throat> against the tenant or, or something of that sort, which is very rare in Japan. But if that happens, court documents, you'll also have to sign yourself in some cases yes, yeah. for everything else that poa will represent you yes via our signature okay okay and i saw something on your website talking about credibility back what is that um, your company it's just or something letters from uh, accountant property lawyer that we work with in japan and some references letters from customers i can also put you in touch with customers uh, directly if you want to just get their impression about working with us ah okay okay I think that's about it. But actually, I mean, it's because, uh, it's Japan. Yeah. You probably know the country a little bit. It's not exactly a place where a company is able to just pocket your money and run for the hills. Everything has yeah, got a yeah, legal yeah. trail to the moon and back, right? So that's not yeah, the yeah. Usually. And actually, it was really uh, interesting. I think the last podcast I heard is like how to convince my Japanese spouse. And I had exactly the same issues. Like <laughs> my... my I, I thought that was made for me, you know, that podcast, because <laughs> my wife, she is Japanese and she, she, 
it took a while, like it's been years. I'm trying to convince her to invest. Uh, uh, but I think because she's like 30, 30 years old. So she never saw inflation or crisis, yeah. I think, in her lifetime. So she believes just save and we don't need to do anything with the money. But I come from Brazil, you know, totally different yeah. background. <laughs> yeah. So I and now that she saw the prices increasing a little bit in Japan. So she's kind of, oh, yeah, maybe we should invest. It could happen, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's usually the case with our customers who have, well, I mean, there are a few exceptions. Most, most of our customers who have Japanese spouses, it's not even convincing. It's just the wife going, yep, this is your thing. You do what you want. Don't involve me in that. So. Uh, yeah, true, true. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, she's kind of like that right now. Like, But before, mm-hmm. she wouldn't agree at all. But she now, okay, I trust you and do whatever you want. But at least I have the green light now. <laughs> It's um, as property uh, investment locations go, it's a very safe and stable one. So yeah. you're not going to get you know, not, super high profits, but you're definitely not going to have big issues yeah. or lose your money. right? Yeah, you're actually like I've always wanted like to invest in real estate in Japan. But I actually your ebook is really is really good because I never thought about this perspective of uh, rental income. My my mental model for real estate was basically capital growth which is in brazil or probably in us or many other countries so i never thought about this oh it's hassle free which makes sense i i know people in japan it tends it makes sense to be hassle free in japan but whereas if i rent the same kind of uh target uh tenant in brazil probably i'll have a lot of problems there like in the u.s as well rent. anything yeah any US, property yeah. that's uh this cheap is gonna have section eight tenants and forced yeah, evictions yeah. and squatters it's it's a very different market here I'm, i don't think i'd be able to operate in other countries like that yeah 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 me too me too i i used to in brazil but i sold i sold and now i went to focus japan at least for real estate and other countries for other things yeah. I think I think that's it. Ziv. Uh, I think we could uh, maybe go ahead, and I don't know how we start the the, yep. the deal. So, like, how well, can we're, I, yeah. So we're happy to send you. Alex can send you some um, property investment samples in a spreadsheet, just to give you an idea of what's mm-hmm. available in the market at your budget. When we we're happy to okay. you know putting some toing and froing and do emails and calls and talk about whatever you want. Once you want us to actually do deeper research and start contacting third parties and sellers and do due diligence, uh, we'll need to be engaged. So those are the uh, two okay. documents you've mentioned that need to be signed and witnessed, and we'll also mm-hmm. need our fee mm-hmm. estimate paid. So because this is your first time buying through us, we're going to have to charge you in advance based on what you think the budget would be. And then post mm-hmm. settlement will credit or debit depending on what you end up purchasing. Okay, it's clear. Okay, that's about it then. <laughs> yeah. So if you wanna just reply to our last email and let me know um, if you want some property research samples or if you wanna just kick off the engagement process and then we'll take it from there. Okay, I will reply the email. Fantastic. Looking forward to working Thank with you. you. Thanks for your time. Thank you for your. Me too. Thank you for your time. Speak to you soon. Bye-bye. So there you have it. Nothing really groundbreaking there, at least not if you've been following this podcast for a while. All things we've discussed here on many occasions, but always good to revisit them periodically, especially when they're lumped in together around the topic of investment properties specifically. Hope you found some value in the conversation. Now, before we go, we're also, as always, going to tell you and also link to our other sponsor's website. That's Hiroshi Shimizu, immigration lawyer and administrative scrivener. If you're thinking about moving here on a more permanent basis, or you're already in Japan on some sort of a temporary visa, and you want to switch to a longer term or permanent one, or if you're considering setting up a local company or a branch office of a foreign company, and you've got any sort of business or visa-related inquiries, or even if you just want to find out what your options are on any of these topics, feel free to contact Hiroshi Shimizu. You can find him at japanimmigrationexperts.com and he can help you set up a company, apply for any kind of visa, or just provide you with the best advice and extremely affordable consultation related to these topics. And he's already done that for many of our listeners. So feel free to reach out to him. Again, that's japanimmigrationexperts.com and you'll be well on your way. And that's it from us for today, folks. Hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Japan Real Estate Podcast. 
Do share it with your networks and please let us know what you think. So leave us a short rating or review on the iTunes store, on Spotify, or just drop us a line in the comment section of wherever you might have found this episode. We love hearing from you. Hope to have you with us again next time. And until then, have a great day or night ahead. Yoroshiku. Thank you.